Manuela Riedo had been in Ireland for three days when her body was found on waste ground near Locatolia in Renmore. The 17-year-old Swiss student was the youngest of a group of students who came to Galway for two weeks to learn English. She left her host family home at Renmore between 7 and 8 p.m. on October the 8th. It was the last time she was seen alive. She did not show up to meet friends in the city centre as arranged and did not attend classes at the language school the next day. The Central Criminal Court heard that in preparation for the trip, female students had been told not to walk alone at night. In this story, I want to mainly speak about the perpetrator so you have a good idea of what we are dealing with. It's beyond my comprehension how this all went so badly wrong and I know you will feel the same way once you hear the full story. It's so upsetting and probably the worst case I've done so far. First is a little information about Manuela. When people think of Manuela, they think of the terrible crime. But what I want you to also think of is the good that came from her death. At least that is what her parents would say. Manuela's memory and legacy still stands today in the foundation that was set up in her name to help people who have suffered sexual assaults. Manuela Rido had a smile as broad and bright as a beam of light. This is how her mother and father would describe her. As an only child, it was a family of a magic circle of three. She loved to dance and even played ice hockey and was advanced for her age at 17 always planning way ahead and knew exactly what she wanted. In October 2007, Manuela was in Galway as a student to attend college to learn English. She decided to go to Ireland first as a stepping stone and then on to America the following year. She was to be here for two weeks and stay with a host family in the city with 40 other students and two teachers. Manuela was from outside Bern in Switzerland and her parents thought as it was her first time to be away from home without them that Ireland would be a good choice and they chose Galway as a safe option. Jared Barry was from a family of nine and was from Rosslyn Glass, Rahoon, Galway City. His father left when he was young and it is said his mother was an alcoholic that suffered mental health problems. The children were beaten regularly and it was said that the children should have been taken into care, but they weren't and were basically left to their own devices. Barry would commit many crimes as a teenager, theft, drug possession, violent disorder, among many other things. At the start of 1996, Barry was sentenced to 18 months for malicious damage, but after a few months he was released. One night Barry was in Air Square in the centre of Galway. He was out with his friends and they would come across a group of lads that were on a stag night. Barry, only 16 at the time and the ringleader of the group of three other teenagers, set upon the stag group and attacked them. One person belonging to the stag group was Colin Phelan from Tipperary. He was hit over the head with a bottle and he would later die from his injuries. Barry was originally charged with manslaughter, but was convicted of violent disorder. He was sentenced to five years in prison and only served two years. Following his release, he was charged on another occasion of aggravated burglary, where he broke into a house of an old age pensioner and beat him so badly that the poor old man was left blind. Barry was sentenced to two years for this, but didn't serve the full sentence either. When he was released, he met a girl and moved in with her. They would go on to have a child together. She suffered terrible abuse from him. And in 2005, after their child was born, she left him and this did not go down too well with him. One night he broke into her home and sexually assaulted her and she took a protection order out against him. She was terrified of him. He received 18 months in prison and he served six. The girlfriend's name was never released in order to protect their child. In March 2007, Barry assaulted two guardi in Galway City, who were attempting to arrest another man. In August 2007, he broke into his ex-girlfriend's house once again by climbing through an upstairs window into her bedroom. He got on the bed and started to strangle her. It was said he was drunk and demanded money from her. 
Their then two-year-old heard the commotion and came into the room and somehow she managed to get to her child and pick him up. Barry smacked her in the side of the head but she got downstairs out the front door and started screaming for help. Barry followed her out and before legging it threatened to kill both of them. 18 hours later a 21 year old French student was out with her friends in Galway City. It was a busy night and on closing of the pubs and nightclubs crowds poured out onto the streets and it was next to impossible to get a taxi. So this girl decided to walk home to Ballybane in the city. When she got to Mareview area she noticed a man wearing a white hoodie and a baseball cap. Before she knew it he had come up behind her grabbed her hair and put a knife to her throat. He said, do what you were told, I just want to shag you. He told her not to look around or look at him or he would kill her. He dragged her into St. James's GA pitch. This was only 10 minutes from her home. She pleaded with him and said she was a virgin, but he ignored her. He groped her, pushed her onto her knees and sodomized her. After what must have seemed like forever, he made a deal with her that if she gave him oral sex, he would then let her go. She conceded, but afterwards he didn't let her go. He told her to then undress. When she did this, he sodomized her two more times. He finally let her go, but not before telling her not to tell anyone as he knew where she lived and he would kill her. When she got home, she took a shower and tried to sleep. The next day she went to the hospital. She was so traumatised she couldn't speak. And so she wrote on a note, I was raped. Meanwhile, Barry's ex-girlfriend had gone to the Gardaí to report what he had done to her and their child. She described what he was wearing, a white hoodie and baseball cap. So the Gardaí realised that the description that the French girl had given matched. Obviously, Barry was known to Gardaí. They brought him in and questioned him, but they didn't have enough evidence to charge him and had to let him go. On the 18th of August 2007, Barry was up in court for the assault on his ex-girlfriend and son. The Gardaí that were connected to the assault on the French girl were at the court and they objected to the bail. The judge in court was just a stand-in and was not familiar with Barry. When the ex-girlfriend was asked if she feared for her life, she said no, and this also was taken into account when bail was granted. Also, the judge would not have been told he was a suspect in a rape case, as this had not been proven and a separate case altogether. The Gardaí could object to bail, but couldn't give reasons why. This makes no sense to me. Manuela was to start classes on the 9th of October 2007 and had only been in Ireland two days when on the night of the 8th of October she left her host home and headed out to meet some friends in the city centre. The walk would take around 40 minutes but she took a shortcut instead through an area known as the line. It's a walkway below the railway line that many people would use. Below this walkway is wasteland and it would be a hangaround area for teens who would drink and party there. When 9pm came round and there was still no sign of Manuela, her friend texted her to know where she was and she got no response. That same friend the next morning noticed Manuela didn't show up for classes and so she rang her but the phone was no longer in use. That same day a man named San Bearden a sculptor and jeweller was taking the shortcut down by the rail line and found a backpack with flowers on it. He presumed it belonged to a student and it had been stolen. He then noticed a purse on the ground and on further inspection of the area, he found Manuela's body. This crime scene was a total nightmare. Like I said before, it was used by teenagers as a hangout and it would be a waste ground for rubbish bottles and used condoms, etc. Manuela was found naked from the waist down and her coat was partially covering her and weighed down with a rock. Her clothes were strewn all around. There was evidence of her being raped and beaten around the head. Her neck had been so compressed 
that the chains she was wearing had left an impression on her skin. There was also cuts to her groin area and a two by three inch piece of skin had been cut out also from this area. Her death was due to strangulation. Her time of death was determined by her stomach contents and was given the time of between 7 and 8 p.m. the evening of the 8th, not long after leaving her host's home. Her phone and digital camera were missing. A button from her coat was found on the walkway and the guardy reckoned she was grabbed from the walkway and dragged down to where she was found. One of the detectives found a used condom hanging from one of the bushes nearby and took it into evidence as well as other rubbish and used condoms. Superintendent Tom Curley led the investigation. Notice was sent out all over Galway for young women to travel in pairs or more. The people of Galway were shocked by this terrible crime. It received huge media attention here in Ireland and Switzerland. Up to 50 Gardaí were assigned to the case. They started to put together a list of possible suspects who had a history of violent sexual offences. One of the first persons to pop up on this list was Gerard Barry, who was still being investigated for the rape of the French girl seven weeks previous. CCTV footage put Barry on Main Guard Street, which is around 10 minutes away from where Manula was found. He would be brought in and questioned and shown the footage and he denied it was him, that the person in the footage was taller and he didn't own a red jacket, which the footage showed the person wearing. But his brother would confirm later on that indeed he did own a red jacket and he was wearing it on the night of the 8th. Barry's apartment would be searched and Manula's camera would be found under his mattress. Barry said he had never seen it before. The phone was sold on three times and when the father of the person who was last to buy it noticed it was in a foreign language and knew of the murder, had the good sense to think that this phone may belong to Manula. He handed it straight over to Gardy. Barry insisted he was nowhere near the area on the 8th but his phone provider would tell a different story. On the 18th of October, Barry was arrested and his DNA was taken and compared to the condom found in the bush and it was a match. His DNA was found on the inside of the condom and Manula's was found on the outside of the same condom. On the 19th of October, he was charged with Manula's murder. On the same day, Manula's funeral would take place with over 500 mourners attending. The mayor of Galway, teachers and students attended the funeral in Switzerland. A memorial mass was also held in Galway, with hundreds attending. Gerard Barry was on remand in Castlereagh Prison. This time he didn't get bail. And in March 2009 the trial took place and it went on for seven days. He pleaded not guilty and said it was an accident. He said he met Manula outside a shop in Ranmore. She asked him for the time. Why would you ask for the time when you own a phone? He then asked her where she was going and she replied to the city centre. He offered to show her a shortcut along the train line. It was mentioned in an interview the father of the host family had warned Manula not to take the shortcut along the train line as people were known to be mugged and it wasn't safe. I just mentioned this because it showed that Manula was already aware of the dangers of the train line walkway shortcut, so she wouldn't have asked him or agreed to go with him. I'm definitely not victim blaming here, as everyone should feel safe wherever they choose to go, but if a stranger offers to bring you through a place you know is dodgy, you would definitely say no. He said that he brought her through the wasteland by the walk line, that they kissed and that she agreed to have sex. They put their coats down on the ground. He said when they finished, she had to go. He put his arm around her neck and when he let go, she fell and was unresponsive. Like what a load of crock. He said he panicked, dragged her body into the bushes, covered her with her coat, took her phone and camera. He couldn't explain the injuries to her head or any of the damages to her genital area. The jury took just two hours and 38 minutes to find him guilty on all accounts. Before sentencing, the detective superintendent 
took 20 minutes to read out his previous 60 convictions. Like, can you believe it? 60 convictions. This is mind blowing. Barry was sentenced to life in prison and a further two five year sentences for the theft of the camera and phone. And technically he was sentenced for the rape also. In July 2009, he was found guilty of the rape of the French student and given another two life sentences, which each sentence can average from 15 to 18 years. So three life sentences altogether, which will hopefully see him behind bars for 45 years at minimum. Fingers crossed this will happen, especially since his incarceration. It is reported that he is best buddies with Graeme Dwyer, who murdered Elaine O'Hara. This is scary to me. There's only one way of looking at this case, and that is the Irish justice system let Manuela down as well as other victims. If Barry had done his full sentence for malicious damage in 1996, Colin Phelan would be alive today. If Barry had not been out on bail for the assault on his ex-girlfriend and son, he would not have raped the French girl and raped and murdered Manula. Manula's parents are now in the process of suing the state for failing to keep their daughter safe. Manuela's parents were not provided an interpreter during the trial as the state said it would be too expensive so they didn't really know what was going on. They knew if something was being said that was upsetting they'd only know by the people in the courtroom reacting or crying but that was all. They claimed they were promised the court documents once the trial was finished but have since been refused on the basis that they are not the victims in the case and only victims have the right to see the reports. This again makes no sense to me. If they are not the victims, I don't know who is. Every year Manuela's parents come to Ireland and they walk the path along the train line and ended at the place where she died. In the weeks and months after Manuela's murder, they received an outpouring of letters and parcels from people across Ireland. They began to meet some of the people who had been profoundly touched by the tragedy. Sam Bearden, who had found her body, said he felt darkness in his life for many months afterwards. Tom Connell, a local farmer, carved a wooden cross and placed it close to where Manuela's body was found. The Garda liaison officer, who travelled with the coffin back to Switzerland, all these people and many more have become firm friends to Manuela's parents. They say they don't blame Galway or anyone in Galway. Manuela's father said if anyone is to blame, it's the judicial system and the perpetrator Barry. There's even a story of when the forensic photographer attended the crime scene. He came across a little robin and on an impulse he took a photograph of it. When he printed it, he took it and framed it and gave it to Manuela's parents on the first day of court and told them the story. They were so grateful and relayed back to him that on the day Manuela was being buried, a little robin landed on the grave. This was so sad and yet it gave them such peace. Manuela's foundation has raised over €140,000 for the Rape Crisis Centre here in Ireland. It has helped educate young people and provided counselling for victims of sexual assault. I will leave you with some footage of the Dingle Marathon from 2015, where people participated on behalf of Manuela's foundation. I also would like to thank GK Media for the permission to use the footage. <laughs>